centuries of colonialism, slavery, post-colonial political misrule and war have left most African nations politically demobilized and economically torn. For long, Africa has been regarded as a hopeless continent, characterized by war, disease, poverty and other malaises. The paradox of it is that Africa is four times the geographical size of the United States, its population three times as big. And more than any other continent, Africa is blessed with an immense wealth of natural resources. With these riches, Africa can become a model of development. Africa is on an upward economic trajectory, yet its wealth disparities are amongst the biggest in the world. As a result, business models to include the poor in value chains as producers, employees and consumers can make a significant contribution towards poverty eradication, education, gender equality, health and the environment, as exemplified by the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. Hi, I'm Natalie Becker, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today at the Foot of Africa for the first episode of our new series, It's Africa's Time, where we look at the efforts of various organizations on the continent and their positive engagement with the environment and the communities in which they operate. Follow us to Tanzania for our first project. After her divorce, there was little time for Dar es Salaam full-time school teacher Oliver Kadegi to dwell on what could have been. Instead, she had to focus her attention on what needed to be done, and she had to find a way to become financially independent. Oliver applied to Bayport for a loan to start a fish and poultry retail business in her community. In the rural area of Mbagala, neighbors used to travel all the way to the ferry to get their fish weekly. But now, they can go to Mbagala market any day to buy the best catch of the day. Na katika mazingira ya kazi mshahara ndio ni mzuri unakidha lakini kutokana na maisha kupanda 2006 nitakupa Bayport nikae menendeza sasa nikabidi kwamba niwe na plan kwamba ili kwamba ni kwa sababu hela unapokopa si inaisha je kama inaisha una kitu gani ulichokiacha ulichokiacha ndipo nika nikawa nimepanga plan ya kutafuta miradi midogo midogo nikaanzisha miradi yangu ya mkao mkao nikaenda lakini nauza mkao lakini ninapomaliza deni naenda tena kuokopa paypot kwa hiyo mkao ndo kaweza kunizalishia unasomeshia watoto wangu nikaweza kununua kuko ifaranga vya kuko nikaweka banda la samaki ili kwamba vyote hivyo viweze kunisaidia pamoja na mshahara kuweza kusomesha watoto na kulipa pango ya nyumba na ninapokwenda mimi ndani ya masaa 24 kweli ninachukua tu pesa na kuja kufanyia biashara zangu kwa sababu biashara zangu anazijua na ndio maana wigongo wa biashara unatanuka Samaki biashara ya samaki ninaipata feri magogoni. Wapo mtani wanauza lakini yake ya ghali sana sio kama kule. Kule feri na maana inabidi unajidamu kasa na moja kasorobo ili uwahi samaki kule kwa bei kidogo nzuri. Nikisha toka nao pole kama muda umeisha kwa sababu kuna mdogo wangu ndiye anaishughulikia kama muda kule umeisha inabidi anatafuta mtu wa kumsafishia kule hawa 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 samaki anawakosha huku yeye kazi yake akija ni kuasoza tu kwenye maji na kuandaa sehemu ya anapopika kama vile tulivyoona akija kwa kanga na anataka pale watu wanununua na wanaonunua ni jamii iliyo tuzunguka samaki ni mboga kuu kwa kazi wa Dar es Salaam kwa sababu gharama yake ni nafuu Mtu atakiwa na mia tatu, anapata nini? Samaki. Mtu atakiwa na mia mbili, anapata, hata kiwa na mia moja, anapata nini? Samaki na anaweza kala, anaweza kaishi. Na mtu kienda, ukijia kukanga kama kwa semu zuri, watu wananunua bila hawana upinzani, tofauti na mikoani. Kwa mfano huna mume, mimi sina mume, na nina familia, nitamwegemea nani. Ni mimi ndo kichwa cha nyumba. Kwa sababu nimesha beba majukumu yote ya kuangali ya watoto wanasoma lipi, watoto wanakula vipi watoto wanaishi vipi kwa mfano watoto wangu wengi sasa wako shule 
lakini wanaporudi na kaa nao wanashalia miradi ile ndiopo tayari ameshashiriki nini kwenye tendo hili anajua kwa hili tendo ndio ninasomesha mimi na furahi sana kwa najisikia raha sana na najisikia fahari tena najisikia fahari kwenye jamii hata hapa nilipo Olipa is uh, is representative of the spark uh, of entrepreneurship that lives in most of our communities and Olipa is a typical example of a repeat borrower who has access credit from Bayport many times to improve their lives, the lives of the people around them and the communities that they're in. By extending scholarships to people, we're able to take them that extra mile and take them from secondary schooling, which is often provided at low cost or, or for free, and take them into a tertiary education where they acquire skills that they can then use to transform the societies that they live in. So. Hassan Rajab from Dar es Salaam is a triple A university student in economics, mathematics and geography. He's currently doing an internship at Bayport after receiving a university scholarship. Hassan Rajab, you're an expert in economics amongst many other subjects. Would you please give us some facts and figures about the current socio-economic situation in Dar es Salaam? Well, Dar es Salaam is one among of the very large city here in Tanzania whereby 87.9% of its people live under two USA dollar as per recently poverty statistics which have been conducted. And its population is about 2.8 million people recently. And we expect in 2020 the population to be about 5.12 million. The unemployment situation in Dar es Salaam is still getting worse because about 75% of people live here is unemployed. Percentage of women headed house in Dar es Salaam recently is 25%. Please tell us a bit about your scholarship and your internship. I'm sponsored with Bayport Financial Services. They announced the publicly all over Tanzania that they are willing to offer the scholarship to two students at high level. So we applied and we were about 62 guys. I sent my application over there. Yeah, I won it. I came here to do my internship. So I think it's very important because it helped me to be embarked with experience. So it helped me a lot. Thanks to Bayport, we've documented some excellent examples of what financial business can do to alleviate poverty in the communities within which they operate. Next, I'm headed to the Republic of South Africa, and I'll meet you there for our next inspiring, life-changing story. Clover's award-winning social responsibility Mama Africa projects are shining examples of how the empowerment of women along with training can help create employment and promote health in isolated or depressed areas of South Africa. Today we meet Professor Elaine Flock, who implemented the project in 2004. She'll introduce us to two of the Clover Mamas. Elaine, what is the goal behind the Mama Africa project? Clover Mama Africa wants to uplift women. We want to empower them by giving them skills, training and equipment. And through that, we really want to get them self-sustainable. Mama Doris, I know that this vegetable plot is a big project for you. Would you like to tell us more about it? I'm coming from not the, the, the poorest family, not the rich family, but a normal family. Uh, at my early age, we have to water the garden before we go to school. My mom was very strict. She taught me how to grow the vegetables. Clover offered me some trainings, how to make your own seed beds. They offer uh, seeds, manure, especially they transported a, a teacher from Gauteng for the training and she stayed here about two weeks. The plot is a quarter of a hectare. I grow spinach, carrots, cabbage, and summer I plant a lot of butternuts, potatoes, tomatoes. The vegetable is helping me a lot. First of all, I feed my family. Then I go out for sales. I sell in the surrounding areas of Kaiskamawuk. There is a clinic nearby. I used to put my veggies there so the patient can come and buy. Elaine, how do you find these mountain-moving women? 
We found these women uh, everywhere in South Africa with the help of our area and or branch managers. And we are approached by people, ordinary people, telling us about women that they know that are taking care of abandoned and abused children, the vulnerable people in the communities, and sometimes people also taking care of elderly people who are really in need of, of help and support. How did you learn to bake? I learned to bake in my grandmother's kitchen. She teaches us how to bake biscuits, cakes, and my first biscuits were ginger biscuits at the age of nine years old. And how did you start the bakery? I started a bakery through Clover Mama Africa, where they taught me skills by baking. My best sellers are my bread, my banana loaves, my Chelsea buns, my malt tarts, and my soft and sweet bake. I permanently employ five people from our community where we bake 200 to 300 loaves of bread a day. I run the bakery and sell the products. Luckily for me, I've got a good husband, Yanni, where I bake all the stuff and he will go to the shops and promote everything and sell everything for us. So, Lucine, which other social services do you carry out here in the community of Ashbury? I've got the soup kitchen where my husband, Yanni, and my two sons, Dekondra and Dimitri, helps me uh, give the food to the people. We've got a social program where we look after abused kids, where I counsel them. The kids face, in their families, they face substance abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, where parents will hit them. They will, the fathers will abuse them sexually, so they will come to me and ask me for guidance. And also we're working with the court. The court will give us children and I will counsel them. I can't take them in my house because it's a thing near to my heart because I also was abused when I was a little girl, so I know what to ask them. Now I can see you've got your hands full with these children. Could you spare a couple of minutes to tell us about the community uh, centre's preschool? It's very important to have a preschool in a place like Ashbury. There's so many kids here and nobody looks after them when their parents are at work. So that's why we are here to teach them. And also in our area there's lots of young ladies getting pregnant. Uh, so single parents are here. So that's why there's so many kids are leaving, being left unattended at homes. Celestine, can you share with us which success story is closest to your heart? The closest success story to my heart is a lady working for me for almost eight years. She was alcoholic and I can truly say she's alcohol free and she's living a happy life. Every year, Clover Mamas from all corners of the country make a long journey to attend an intensive week of training. Aptly called Smarties Week, the mamas receive workshops that complement their existing self-help projects. Each mama receives a trophy in recognition of their hard work and commitment to the project. Mama Doris was the best farmer of the year in 2010, and Mama Celestine was best businesswoman in 2011. The way to transfer the skills to the to other projects, when I get back from the trainings, because sometimes I'm called to Joburg to have the baking training, I call them then I show them what I've learned. Each and everybody is allowed to get the skill and go to her community and teach them. My final aim within this community is to create more jobs and make my bakery sustainable to create an income for myself and also members in the community. Currently, 35 extraordinary Clover Mamas collectively look after more than 12,800 abandoned, abused, orphaned and HIV AIDS infected and affected children as well as 3,500 senior citizens in more than 35 geographic locations throughout South Africa. As the saying goes, you teach a man, he'll teach a man. You teach a woman and she'll teach a generation. Years and years ago, people looked after each other. No one went without food, clothing or shelter. The strong protected the weak, children and the aids. Skills were passed on from generation to generation. Elders were respected for their insight. It was a beautiful system in which everyone had a special role and a place of belonging. Call it ancient African wisdom or the concept of Ubuntu. I am who I am because of others around me. I am because we are. To promote gender equality and empower women is one of the UNDP priorities, not only as human rights, but also because they are the best pathway to helping achieve all the other Millennium Development Goals, as well as sustainable development.
After many years working as an educator and getting involved in the community, John Gilmore opened the first LEAP Science and Math School, serving the township of Lunga in 2004. There are now six LEAP Science and Math high schools throughout South Africa. Today, It's Africa's Time meets two women, Nolu Yolu, a 16-year-old who lives in Lunga and attends LEAP No. 1, and Lindelwa, an ex-student who now teaches at the school. Tell me what motivated you to found the LEAP schools. I've lived and taught in South Africa since the inception of apartheid through to post-apartheid reality that we, we have now. And during that time, we have created a real mess. My own journey as a white South African through apartheid brought with me a realization of just how much needs to be done to create real opportunity for the poorest of the poor children in South Africa to have access to quality education. So the model of the LEAP School is to create a family away from the family and in that family to actually push for change. So we create a long day, a home away from home with caring teachers who become part of the extended family and where we have difficult conversations to help shape citizens for the future. Young people who will come out of school ready to lead immediately, ready to be agents of change in their own communities and ready to speak truth to power. What are the subjects that you're studying at LEAP? I do COSA, English, Math, Physics, IT, Accounting and Life Orientation. And what do you see yourself doing in the future? What are you passionate about? Being a chartered accountant and also a person who actually comes back to the community and give back. Coming from where I come from, there, so it's so rare to find many opportunities. So whenever you get them, you make sure that you perform at your best ability. If you set yourself a good goal, then you're going to follow it. If you don't, then that's how your life will be. Education is critical in any society. We focus on skills development and to the extent that people are skilled, then they will be able then to do great things for themselves. Now, accounting is indeed a fine example of how maths can help students springboard or leap into the working environment. And as an ex-student of LEAP yourself, you used to sit on these very same benches. Um, yeah, I was an ex-student also at LEAP. It doesn't focus on subjects only. It also focuses on the humane side. So you find that there's a class called life orientation where you sit and you talk about your problems. That's why I became a teacher, because I wanted the students to actually get what I got here at school. How did you get your teacher training? Um, LEAP started a program called Future Leaders Program in 2007 where they take 10% of the graduates um, from LEAP and make them um, teachers. Now it's obviously a very holistic and comprehensive approach to education, but tell me about why the focus on scientific subjects. Well, history has marginalized black people from the point of view of maths and science in this country. And we live with a reality that only a very small number of people living in townships have access to classrooms where maths and science are taught. So the Leap Science and Math Schools is taking its place at the forefront of that social engineering for a change to that reality. All Mutual in being the primary supporter of Leap School, giving it these premises and supporting it as much as it does, is demonstrating its own commitment to the long-term prosperity of South Africa, which is really dependent on the quality of the human capital and the social capital that we build if we want to be a successful democracy. Higher education is key for sustainable development in Africa. Training teachers and students in subjects as challenging and necessary as maths and science has proven the best way to promote self-perpetuating development in the long run. For our last story of this episode, let's travel from coast to coast and from a city to a rural environment to the South African wild coast to visit the lovely lemongrass ladies of Bulangula. The 
Hamath administrative area has a population of around 6,000, of which 78% live below the poverty line, increasing by 10% each decade. In Qeleni village, over half the households have had at least one child die, and a third of those have lost more than one child, mainly due to diarrhea, probably caused by the lack of clean water. The Bulangula incubator was launched in response to this dire situation. The Old Mutual Foundation has provided funding uh, and mentorship to the Bulungula Incubator since uh, 2008. One, it not only addresses uh, our desire to activate uh, and rural communities and to create opportunities for, uh, for them to be economically active, but it's especially wonderful in that there's huge uh, participation by women. Also play a very important part in the imparting of those skills to, to the children uh, and so we're really proud of the Bulungula um, incubator. The former Transkai was uh, established as the Transkai as a homeland in 1976 mm -hmm. by the then apartheid government. It's largely been under service, as you may know, because of the history of the area. Since post-1994, it's largely remained the same as it was before, mm -hmm. with uh, lack of roads, poor health care facilities, uh, poor social services in this area. So that was one of the reasons that led to the establishment of the Pulungula Incubator. The Pulungula Incubator has got four uh, focus areas, that's education, social services, community health and sustainable livelihoods. There is a total of about 200 people employed directly by the Pulungula Incubator. It's a direct benefit for about 4,000 people. None of the 20 lemongrass farmers have ever been formally employed, so they've had to rely on child grants and for some, irregular remittances from husbands working at the mines in the northwest province. Being part of this project opened them to a world of entrepreneurship and commerce. With their new income, these women are now able to supplement their household incomes and buy food and other necessities. The lemongrass is planted and tended to until maturity at three months old. The leaves are then harvested using sickles, leaving the plant stock to regrow new leaves. The harvested leaves are thereafter dried in solar drying tunnels. Not all the lemongrass is used for tea processing, as most of the winter crop doesn't grow tall enough and is affected by rust and thus not usable in tea production. This lemongrass is harvested and distilled for essential oils. The essential oils are then used in soaps, bath salts or sold as oils. The farmers independently produce and sell their lemongrass to the market. The cooperative members have a minimum of 1,200 lemongrass plants each and together produce 25 tonnes of lemongrass per year, all certified organic. Did you know that lemongrass grows by moonlight and these exotic plants respond at night to the care and hard work their procreators invest by day? That story wraps up our first episode of It's Africa's Time, where we've witnessed how women in Africa can create sustainable lives for their families and their communities through training and enterprise. But before we end today's program, we'd like to ask an official member of the UNDP how she envisions the role of commerce in the empowerment of women in Africa. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time on It's Africa's Time. The MDGs set out basic development milestones. If you are passing these milestones, you are on a roll with development. You've got every child through primary education. You've substantially reduced poverty and hunger. Now, sustainable business practice from the micro level up can make a huge contribution to achieving the MDGs, not least in making people food secure and reducing and hopefully eliminating extreme poverty. In parts of Africa, as in parts of our world generally, women don't enjoy anything like equal representation or voice in the political structures, the decision-making structures. Uh, they are at a disadvantage when it comes to owning or renting land, uh, accessing credit, uh, having the sort of inputs that would really make a small business, agricultural or otherwise, hum. So for development to really take off and benefit whole countries, we have to bring women into the equation. We have to invest in girls, opportunities for women. That way we'll not only achieve Millennium Development Goals, but we will see Africa and the rest of the developing world really making progress. I think that uh, women are very entrepreneurial. Given a chance, 
they'll access the credit, they'll use the opportunities, they'll create a better livelihood for themselves and their families. So supporting the creation of those micro businesses, small businesses, right from the very smallest level is absolutely critical to the empowerment of women and the growth of a vibrant private sector in societies.